Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. But just like you, when I leave this auditorium, this room, I live in a real world. And it's a world I've noticed is filled with devastation and and destruction and discouragement. And so what I'm doing is looking at, well, what was Jesus doing about all that? Because I'd like to suggest today that he's still about that same business. Only with Jesus. Only with you. Part three of Pastor Sam's message, The Great Physician. Today, after a little recap, we return to Matthew 9, beginning in verse 18. Today's study will see Jesus heal one woman and bring one little girl back from the dead. Great reminders to us that regarding the things we have no control over, Jesus has complete mastery. Most of us have had the very experience we see Jesus having and his disciples having as there's this this move from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where there was that glorious time with the Lord on the mount, listening to his teaching, just basking in the wonder of the things he was expressing. And then we get into chapters 8 and 9, and it goes from this wonderful mountaintop experience to this down in the valley reality. It's sort of back to the real world, if you will. And I'd like to suggest that that happens to us as well. If things go right here, if you come with an expectation that it's going to be more than a sing along and a a little lesson, but that you are actually going to encounter the Lord in the services and he's going to speak to you personally in and through his word. Well, it'll be a mountaintop experience. And I know a lot of you have that kind of experience here. And and I want to tell you, for me, it's a blast. I love getting into his word. I love studying it. I love teaching it. But just like you, when I leave this auditorium, this room, I live in a real world. And it's a world I've noticed is filled with devastation and, and destruction and discouragement. And so what I'm doing is looking at, well, what was Jesus doing about all that? Because I'd like to suggest today that he's still about that same business. And if we can grab hold of what takes place in the valley for him, we'll be better prepared to go out and deal with the valley before us. Well, in any case, if you weren't with us, and this is more than a review, it really lays a foundation to understand the significance of the things we're reading. After Jesus descended that mountain, the very first thing he was confronted with was a leprous man. And he came to him in chapter 8 and said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, he had some things absolutely right. He knew Jesus was able, but he was saying, if it's your will, if you're willing, if it's in accordance with your perfect will. He understood the power of Jesus, but he was submitted to the sovereignty of Jesus. So he makes no demands. He just says, I know what you can do. And of course, he was praying, hoping that it would be the will of God. Well, Jesus says, I am willing. And he did the unthinkable. He touches a leper. He did the impossible. He healed the leper. And then... Hey, from that moment on, this guy begins to walk and praise and and represent the Lord. It was a powerful demonstration that the things he taught us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 about the kingdom and about who he was and what he came to do, hey, he meant business. Now, he heals this guy with a word and a touch. And then there's a centurion servant. And uh, when he comes saying, hey, my servant is is ill and and perhaps even dying, Jesus says, well, I'll come and heal him. And, and he says, hey, I'm not worthy. It was a wonderful picture. Again, he, he recognizes and places his faith, not just in the fact that Jesus can heal, but hey, Jesus, if you can heal, you can heal from a distance. And, and you need to see that as these various miracles take place, that Jesus is dealing with each one of them personally and individually. There's not just sort of a blanket process or, well, just fill out these forms and, you know, or take this or do this. No one prescription for everybody. The great physician deals with us personally and individually. So the centurion servant, he understood authority. He was under authority, he said, and 
and he yielded authority. And, and so Jesus simply says, I have not seen such great faith, not in all of Israel, amazed by the faith of this man. So a leper who has faith in Jesus, a centurion who has faith in Jesus, the third healing was Peter's mother-in-law, and uh, she didn't really show any faith, at least in the passage, nor did Peter. There was no petition. Jesus just came in. Maybe it was just practical. He knew she was a good cook. She's sick. He heals her, and the chow's on. <laughs> but, but I don't know that. I'm just saying there's, there's nothing there to suggest anybody did anything except Jesus. And that was he saw a need and he met it. And we need to know that sometimes that's how God works, just sovereignly in a life and in a situation. In fact, I've seen this so often, I have to admit to you, sometimes people come up after the service and they say, will you pray for me? Listen, I've tried to get in the habit of always praying right then. And here's why. If I pray for you once, I'll remember to pray for you again. But if I just say, I'll pray for you, sure, and you don't give me a note or something, well, by the time you're gone, other people come up, other people, another service, more and more people. I go home. I'm completely brain dead. And then I see you the next week. And you're like, oh, thanks for praying. The Lord answered the prayers. And I'm like all embarrassed, right? Because I'm like, oh, wow, I forgot to pray. And I don't know, should I tell you I didn't pray for you? Or should I let you think I was praying for you? But, but here's the deal. Sometimes I'm not even praying. You're not even praying. You're just in a situation. And the Lord just touches the situation, touches your life. You need to know that he is so good. He doesn't always wait for us to realize our need. Sometimes he just meets us at the point of need. Well, we see those first three examples. And then there was the demonics. Those demonics that were freed of their, de their demons and... Um, you know, then just commanded to go and and um, and that's what happened. So in, in the first four cases, there was there was a word and a touch. There was just the word. There was a touch. And, and then there was a command. And in every case, the Lord accomplished his perfect will. Now, the fifth and final example leading up to our passage today was that paralytic who was lowered down by his friends. And, uh, of course, it was the faith of the friends that brought him to Jesus. And we saw what a wonderful example that is for us, that, that we should have faith for them and we should encourage them. And if necessary, then we should bring them into the presence of Jesus, if possible. Well, Jesus forgives him. And then he heals him after there's a little bit of a ruckus there as the religious leaders are starting to almost get it. And they're like, hey, nobody can forgive sin but God. They didn't realize how close they were and how right they were. Yeah, that's true. Only God can forgive sin and Jesus is God. And he says that you may know I have power on earth to forgive sin. I'll say to you, rise up and walk. Well, see, that's what happens. He forgives him and he heals him and he does it simply by his word. Now, we look at four more notable miracles in this latter part of chapter 9. And one of the things we're going to observe and see is that there is no established pattern or formula. We've already seen there's diversity in how Jesus was healing and dealing. But it's so important because... By nature, my human nature is, I want to figure out how this works. I want to, I want to see if I do this, what was, will he do? Or if I say this, then what's going to happen as a result? Excuse me. Throat's just getting a little dry today. I don't know what it is. But anyway, the bottom line is, I believe the reason Jesus did so many things so many different ways is he wanted to make sure we didn't pattern him, that we didn't formulate it, that we didn't try to put him in a box and say, well, this is how God works or this is how God heals. Now, there are some constants here. One of the things we do see in every, well, in most of these, I, I can't really say in all of them, in seven of the nine cases, we find that that faith was exercised in Jesus. In nine of the nine, the miracle was affected by Jesus. That's important as well. Why? Because today, when we pray for people, it's Jesus who's actually healing people. We don't have the power to heal. We don't have the power to save. We just have the ability to pray and say, in the name of the Lord, and, and he's the one who should be getting all glory. Why? He's the one who's actually working if any work is getting done. Well, 
if we can't pattern them, but we can see that the consistent factor is that they came to him and they had faith in him. So important. It's not how much faith, but the object of our faith. Because great faith in a lie, well, it won't change the lie to truth. Great faith in, in, in a false teacher or a false prophet or a false leader, well, it won't change the fact that, that they're imposters, that they're counterfeits. No, it's faith in Jesus, in his word, in his work. And that's what was working here, you see. In seven of the nine cases, they exercised, someone exercised faith in Jesus. In two of them, he just sovereignly met a need that was at hand. Well, in, in each and every case, we do see someone um, being touched by our Lord. And, and that brings us then to verse 18 here in Matthew 9. Having spoken these things, a ruler came to him and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now we know from the other gospel accounts, this guy was a ruler of the synagogue. That, that means he was a man of great respect and responsibility. He most likely would have been well off. So whatever doctors were available, no doubt he'd already gone that route or it was too late for that route. He comes to the Lord because he's in a desperate situation. And you need to know that many people come to the Lord in the midst of their desperation. But Jesus turns this desperation into a celebration. And, and, and that's what I'm hoping will happen for you, that you'll connect with him, meet with him, especially if you're in a time of, of trial or tribulation, a season of desperation. He comes because his precious 12-year-old only daughter is at the point of death. Now, by reading all three gospel accounts, we find when he left, she was dying. But before they ever head back or get back, she dies. And the word comes, hey, it's too late, forget it, she's dead. But the Lord doesn't see it that way, and this guy doesn't see it that way. Because Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid, just believe. Some have suggested his faith was lesser than that of the centurion, because the centurion said, hey, just speak the word. And this guy's saying, hey, come and lay hands on her, come and, and, and touch her. I know she'll recover. I think he had at least as great a faith, or greater faith. Why? The need was more severe, especially once she died. He's believing, trusting that our Lord can touch the dead and speak to the dead and bring life to the dead. Well, there's an obvious spiritual parallel because each and every time we meet, we share the gospel. The gospel is a simple message. It, it just birthed out of the idea that all of us are sinners. And if you're not familiar with that concept, it's absolutely biblical and true. Maybe not popular in our culture, but True, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is perfect, we're imperfect. And so he says we're sinners by nature, we're sinners by act. Because of that, we're in need. We're in need of forgiveness, of redemption. And the gospel is that God sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. He pays the penalty. And that's good news. He has power over death. That's good news. Well, we'll come back to this story because it's interrupted for us by a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Now, here's Jesus on his way to meet one need, to deal with one devastating situation. And on the way, he's confronted with yet another need. I don't know if that happens to you. It certainly happens to us that it seems that more often than not, though there are seasons where, where things are kind of calm, Lots of people go through serious times of crisis and, and trial and tribulation. And, and so if we're seeing it right, not just the pastoral staff or the Sunday school staff, but each and every one of us, that is an opportunity for us to, to share the love of Jesus, to share the, the plan of Jesus. In any case, here's this ruler comes to the Lord, worships him, says, my daughter, man, she's gone, but I know that if you'll come lay your hands on her, she'll live. Hey, that is great faith. That's radical faith, and it's rightly placed. It's all about him. Now, I love that the Lord didn't say, well, 
Haven't you heard what happened with the centurion? I mean, I could do this from here. The Lord just graciously meets with people right where they're at. We need to do that same thing. Not be quick to correct them or say, well, look at this. But just to say, yes, I'll meet that. I'll do that. I'll tend to that. Well, this woman comes up, verse 20, who'd had a flow of blood for 12 years. She came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Now get this. One guy says, if he'll just touch my daughter, she'll be healed. This gal says, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be healed. Now, Matthew doesn't give us all of the details on any of this, but, but let me fill in just a couple blanks. Both Mark and Luke tell us that this gal had spent all that she had in an attempt to be made well. Now, Mark tells us she spent it all and got worse. Luke, who's a physician, doesn't point out got worse because, well, you know, a little physician's pride there. But, but he does acknowledge she'd spent all her money on physicians and none could help her. Her situation was devastating for a variety of reasons. She was ceremonially defiled. That meant she was a social outcast. She was a spiritual outcast. And we know that, that she was struggling financially because she'd spent everything she had trying to get better so she could socialize and, and function spiritually, go to the feast, go to the celebrations. So here she is, and, and she truly is as desperate as this father. He desperate for his daughter. She desperate just to get her life back. Twelve years of suffering, of desperation. And so she comes to this conclusion, if I can just touch that which is touching him, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. I want to tell you that for us, those of us who walk with the Lord, who represent the Lord, who people are watching, they know we're Christians, they actually believe this same thing. And, and oftentimes it, it takes some time to come to the conclusion. But, but here's what happens. They know you're a Christian and maybe they even make a little fun of you or try to get you to do things you're not supposed to do, mess with you. But in their time of trial, of temptation or of desperation, they will come. And because they know you're for real because they've seen your compassion, because they've seen your integrity, because they, they see you as a genuine Christian, they're going to think, if I can just get next to him or her, if I can just touch them because they're touching the Lord. And, and truly, it's our opportunity to make it clear to them, listen, the Lord's there for you too. I don't think many unbelievers get that. I don't think many backsliders believe it. They think that the Lord's blessing us because of how good we are. Now, we know better. We know it's his grace. We know it's his mercy. But the bottom line is, God's just being good to us because God is good. And we need to let them know, listen, I'm so glad you came. And I want you to connect with the one who really can make a difference, who really can do something. Yes, I'll pray for you. Yes, I'll be praying for you. But, but it's Jesus they've got to connect to. And, and, and that's what I see here. She's like, if I can just connect with something connected to Jesus, that will do. And, and it's, though it may be minorly misplaced or imperfect, the idea being is I'm going to get close enough to Jesus for his power to touch me and make a difference and to heal me. Now, we're not told here in Matthew's account again that after she did touch him, Jesus said, who touched me? She had cowered away. She was hiding in the crowd. The disciples are a little perturbed, no doubt, by this question. It's like, what? Who touched you? We're mobbed here. Are you joking, Lord? But, but here's what he's saying. No, I'm not asking who bumped into me. I'm saying who took hold of me? Who touched me? Why? He said, I felt power. I felt power go forth from me. Now, I don't believe that just happened and Jesus was like, oh, wow, that was trippy, you know. Power went through me. No, I think he knew that she touched him and understood why and he met her in a spiritual, very real and physically healing way. But, but my point is, what he wants to do is draw her out. Now, he could have easily figured it out. But what he's trying to do is draw her out. So he says, who touched me? Power went forth. She comes out of the crowd and, and, and says, Lord, it was me. And, and what happens is 
he pulls her out because when the Lord does touch you, when the Lord does meet you in your time of desperation or your point of extremity, listen, he wants you to testify to it. That's why he told the, the demon-possessed man there on Gadara, when he said, let me go with you, he said, no, go home and tell him what great things God has done for you. And he wants us to do the same. When he touches us, when he blesses us, when he heals us, when he comforts us, he wants us to bear witness to that reality. And he calls us out to do it. He gives us opportunity to do it. By the way, that's why after the invitation, and we give one at every service, an opportunity for you, if you haven't yet given your life to the Lord, for you to, to take that step, to pray that prayer, to, to say, Lord, I'm a guilty sinner. You're a holy God. I, I see my sins separating us. I want to know you. I want to know your forgiveness. I, I want to be close to you. I want to be transformed by you, useful to you, glorifying to you. Lord, come into my life. When we do that afterward, we always ask you to come down and to stand here. Now, people don't always take advantage of that. And I get that. Took my wife months of going to church with Greg Laurie, amazing evangelist, and we're there week after week after week. And finally, she just couldn't keep herself anymore. And she raised her hand. And she went down. And, and, it's, and I know that that's a big thing for a lot of people. Hey, it's one thing to in private with every head bowed and eyes closed, pray and say, Jesus, touch me, change me, forgive me, heal me. It's another thing to stand up in front of people and say, hey, God has touched my life. He's transformed my life. He's, he's given me life. But see, that's for your benefit and the benefit of all the people around. That's why he called her out. And that's why he calls us out. Well, in the midst of all of this, he tells her, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And we see in every instance, except those two again, that faith was placed in him. Even though she was like, well, just the hem of the garment, that was close enough. That was good enough for her. And God honored it. She was made well from that hour. Well, he comes to the ruler's house then, having sandwiched this miracle in between the introduction and the, the culmination of this other miracle. He comes to the ruler's house. There are these flute players and noisy crowds wailing. They actually had professional mourners in that culture in that day. It's hard for us to really get a handle on a, to get a, you know, it just seems weird to me after all these years of reading it and understanding it. But they would hire people and they would come and weep and wail and mourn. And so they're there. Why? Because this little gal has died. And then Jesus says, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. Now, don't misunderstand this term sleeping. It is never used in the scripture of the soul. It is never used of the consciousness. It is only used of the body. And the reason for that being, well, a body that's sleeping and a body that's dead, they look very much alike. The only real difference being that the dead body, well, no breath, no pulse, no heartbeat. And so I'm not saying that's a minor difference. It's significant. But what I am saying is because sleep and death look alike, the Bible uses this euphemism of sleep. But there's another reason Jesus calls it sleep. Because death, even physical death, is a temporary setback. We were all created for and fitted for eternity. We have a soul that is going to live forever. We have a consciousness that will exist forever. And the bottom line is, whether you're prepared for it or not, when you die, well, your soul, your consciousness, your fate will be sealed forever. And so, good question, and, and probably at this point, do you know if you died today, if you died tonight, would it be true for you, as it is for most here, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Or would you be separated from the Lord because you never gave your life to the Lord, because you died in your sins? Jesus is truly our everything. He is the one who gave us life. He is the one who sustains it. He is the one who heals us. And he is the one who redeems us. When we fully recognize this, it can have an amazing, calming influence over us, even in times of sickness and despair. Think of what Psalm 112 says about the one who does this. Surely he will never be shaken. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.